And today I want to talk to you about um, two places, uh, Cordoba and Baghdad, from a thousand years ago, where scholars were actually sharing these same concerns as Arabo-Islamic society was starting to classify knowledge and organize it and produce encyclopedic works. In particular, I'll start with a fascinating project that started in Cordoba in the 10th century. It's called The Necklace, Al-Aqd. And the necklace was produced at a time when Al-Andalus was transitioning from a small emirate to being a caliphate. That happened when the ruler, Abdurrahman III, after 16 years of being a successful uh, emir, decided one day to become a caliph. And with that transition, Ibn Abd Rabbihi, who was a courtier at the palace, produced this encyclopedic work of 25 volumes, in which he proposed he was recreating the entirety of human experience. Uh, he also tells us that this book will be kafian wafian. It will be comprehensive and complete. Okay. But he's humble enough, he tells us, my merit in this uh, book, in this work, is only compiling the reports, exercising good choice, husnul akhtiyar, summarizing well, and writing an introduction to each book. Everything else uh, he has taken from the works of those who came before him. But he reminds us, selecting speech is harder than composing it. We can see already from the title of the book, the metaphor of the necklace, very interesting implications. First, it highlights the aesthetic value of knowledge, uh, both uh, physically right, and spiritually, and actually the colors reflecting the light. Uh, this is uh, the embodiment of the spiritual in the aesthetic, this resonates with medieval culture in the Islamic world, but also in medieval Europe. Think of all the churches uh, and the glass uh, walls. It also entails that when you have knowledge, you exhibit it, right? You wear it on you. So it invokes this idea of sharing knowledge and uh, this communal aspect of, of knowledge production. And so, um, lastly, it reminds us that knowledge in its all variety can come together in one threaded, complete whole. And he actually tells us, uh, the author tells us in the introduction, I entitled my work, The Book of the Necklace, because the gems of speech it contains are finely threaded together and beautifully organized in one whole. And then he adds, I'm quoting again, when readers or listeners access the knowledge presented in my book, they will find it a goodly tree, shajaratun tayyiba, with lofty branches growing in good soil, zakiyatul manbat, and bearing ripe fruits. Whoever eats of these fruits will be an heir to prophecy and wisdom. So, so here we see the ethical component of knowledge production. As in Al-Aqud, these rich uh, cosmologies produced in Arabo-Islamic medieval culture with their delusions of completeness and comprehensiveness were possible, were made possible through the concept of khtiyar, which literally translates into like selection, choice. Um, the idea, it speaks to this constant challenge of reconciling the self with the universe, the subjective with the collective, but also and more urgently perhaps, ikhtiyar suggests preservation, you know, our uh, constant tendency to resist oblivion, decay and loss, to hold on to the world by repeating it and recreating it. Yet the desire to cohere the world into encyclopedic book um, is simultaneously an act of oblivion and often of deliberate exclusion. And Arab Islamic uh, scholars were quite aware of this political implication. We have a testimony from a leading scholar from Baghdad from the ninth century. Ibn Qutayba, who was a scholar but also a judge, wrote a book on uh, poets and poetry, Kitab al-Shu'ar wa 
And in this book, he laments the impossibility of encompassing all that has been produced in the realm of poetry. And he explains to us the degrees of exclusion he had to follow in his work, uh, somewhat apologizing to us in advance. In this book, he says, I'm mostly reproducing the works of famous poets. And this speaks to the conversations we had yesterday in the symposium. I rarely mention poets who are unknown, rarely cited, or whose poetry is dated, and only known in certain circles. The reason being that I have access to very few of them. And of the few I know, I do not have access to reports and stories to associate with them. إذ كنت لا أعرف منهم إلا القليل ولا أعرف لذلك القليل أيضا أخبارا. And thus, he continues, I decided to leave them out. Perhaps you, may God have mercy upon your soul, assumed that a book such as ours should include every single poet, old and new. But poets are too many to exhaust, even if a scholar were to dedicate their entire life to this effort. So Ibn Qutayba here is telling us that knowledge production, what we write, what we transmit, and what we publish, is a selection of a selection of a selection, and so on. And so publishing, we should be reminded, is an act of uh, deliberate exclusion. But Ibn Qutayba also reminds us that the idea of writing and publishing is, at its heart, is an act of repeating. And here I want to take us uh, to contemporary times for a moment and quote my favorite uh, contemporary writer, uh, Enrique Belamatas from Spain, who has a protagonist sharing these same concerns, his, uh, the protagonist of his novel, Mac and His Problem. A voice was saying, repetition is my strongest suit. My vocation is as a modifier of things and as a repeater of things too. But that vocation is more commonplace. Essentially, we are all repeaters. Repetition is the most human of gestures. The protagonist here is echoing centuries-long debates on notions of repetition. The circles of writers, readers, and publishers debated from the beginning of times. Being at the intersection of quoting and representation, I go back here to the concept of khtiyar, which fall under, uh, falls under the broader postmodern debates over the practice of transmission. Um, quotation, parody, reference, reuse, restoration, the notion of copious knowledge, uh, and or the interconnected question of origins, authenticity, and urgency, or relevance. Who would read? Why reproduce? Why are we doing this? We have one philosopher who answers this question early on. Kierkegaard speaks of repetition and compares it to recollection. He suggests that the two are the same, repetition, recollection. But he tells us they go in opposite directions. So I'll quote here, what is recollected is repeated backward, whereas repetition, properly so-called, is recollected forward. Therefore, he tells us, repetition makes a person happy, whereas recollection makes them unhappy. Uh, and, and here his, although it sounds a bit dated, but he's pointing to something interesting. We write, we read, we publish because there is an element of joy, but also there is power, right? Repetition doesn't only mean that we're creating a new, it means we are the readers of the past, the interpreters, and the soul crafters. We choose, and choosing, or akhtiyar, is dangerous. Another prominent uh, thinker of our time, Agamben, in his book, The Man Without Content, building on uh, Benjamin Walter's uh, theory of repetition, he tells us, the power of quotations come not from their ability to transmit the past, but from their capacity to make a clean sweep, to expel from the context, to destroy. Alienating by a force 
a fragment of the past from its historical context, the quotation at once makes it lose its character and invest it with an alienating power that forms its aggressive force. Here I also want to quote a Polish thinker, um, the desire to draw the canonical text out of, it, out of its historical remoteness into the present, to make it not only comprehensible, but also, as it were, present. This is especially relevant to us as we are poised today to read and select from a vast repertoire, uh, a multilingual repertoire of classical, medieval, and modern uh, literature. The act of reading then pulls the text across distance, whether historically, linguistically, or culturally, and makes it a host to new experiences. Texts distant from us have something to say to us, and this something cannot be known in advance. It happens, it materializes in the act of reading itself. And here I want to pause for a second and speak about a fictional um, uh, character uh, in a poem that kind of reflects these questions. Um, it's from a poem by Adonis, a Syrian writer, and the name of the character is Mahyar. And Adonis asks, Man anta, man takhtar ya Mahyar? Anna tajahta. الله أو هاوية الشيطان هاوية تذهب أو هاوية تجيء والعالم اختيار Who are you? Whom do you choose, Mahyar? Wherever you turn, you will find God or the devil's abyss, a hell coming or a hell going, and the world is a choice. But Mahyar cannot choose yet. He answers, my uncertainty is that of one who shines, one who knows all things. That's when Adonis tells us he has, Mahyar has no ancestors. His roots are in his footsteps. And Mahyar's face, quote, fire consuming the world of familiar stars. So what I would like to leave us with here is that as readers, as writers and publishers, we are interpreting the past and the present. We are the ultimate and most profound goal of existence. And with here, I want to conclude with a hadith Qudsi. And hadith Qudsi, uh, literally hadith, it means a talk or a report, and it came to be associated with prophetic hadith. Uh, these are reports uh, about the prophet of Islam, about things he said and did that became a sunnah, so a model to follow. But hadith Qudsi is actually, uh, the meaning of it comes from God, although the words come from the prophet. It's conceived through a vision or within the spirit of the prophet. So it's in between the prophetic hadith and the Quran. And I picked one that I find just fascinating, very relevant to what we do. So, and this hadith goes as follows. I was a treasure, so this is God speaking. I was a treasure, yet unknown, and I desired to be known. And for that, I created the world so I would be known. Kuntu kenzen makhfiyan, fa'ahbabtu an u'rafa. فَخَلَقْتُ الْخَلْقَ لِكَيْ أَعْرَفْ Thus, in all of these books, there are never a conclusion, it never ends. Um, one of the main aspects and one of the main kind of beliefs is that language was fixed. الْمَعَانِي مَعْرُوفَ كُلُّ الْمَعَانِي مَعْرُوفَ The well of meanings had already been discovered and everything that had yet to be discovered was of marginal value. Um, and yet, these things inscribed and re-inscribed and built on top of them, on top of each other. Spoiler, which is an act of building on building, of using previous buildings for future buildings. Ghana'im um, is a kind of translation, yet doesn't quite compute. Um, in its most basic form, 
a series of rocks repurposed, reconfigured, mm -hmm. rearranged. Um, as in the case of the Shrine of Serene, the ancient Roman temple, now Sidi Mukhtar, a Sufi shrine. Mm -hmm. Here, a tree, a tree that once marked where the temple of Adonis was Sidi Bouzet. And yet, in other instances, it is the features themselves that get repurposed. The baths of Aphrodite in the Atlas Mountains. Sayyidina Rabia. And yet, these, let's say, accumulations, sedimentations, is present in architecture as it is in literature. She shot me with an arrow whose feathers were the eyelashes which did not hit the outer parts of my skin while it was splitting my heart. They, the women, mortally wound the hearts of men with arrows which have been feathered by the use of colorium and the constant preening. Women who shot with arrows whose feathers are eyelashes and which rend the hearts before the skins. Sariqat, thefts, literary borrowings, a genre of anthologies, a genre of literature, of adab, an unmarked desert which, guy, which the guide in it cannot traverse unless his eye be tied to the Pleiades, El Himani. In its waste expanses, I tied my gaze to the Pleiades, and when they had set, I tied the cheeks of my face to the heat of the sun, Al Mutanabbi. In many a waterless desert have I emancipated, have I emaciated my riding beast, galloping while my gaze was entrusted to the sky, Dibin. Poems, writing on poems on top of other poems. Here we have a concept. Some poets add value, some poets reduce value. And it's really a question of haq, istihqaq. And he made me lovesick until I was like his eyelids, and he made me heavy until I was like his buttocks. Al Khubzori. His glance made me lovesick, and love for him burdened me, and with a heavy load, as if, as if, as if I were his posterior, al Dimashqi. He lent me the sickness of his eyelids, and he burdened me with love passion, the weight of what his tunic enwraps, al mutanabbi And yet at times, these, these sariqat allude to things, and yet do not particularly state them. They reference what the reader already knows, and yet do not make explicit within the verse exactly what they're mm. referring to, mm. an intertextual entanglement. And within these, we think through the ways in which different buildings, and let's say spaces, entangle, interweave, implicate, and place within each other. And so we have a series, again, of shrines, Islamic shrines of different kinds, of mosques, etc. And they place within them a series of columns. And yet, they edit, they reorder, they rearrange. Columns come in a variety of heights. And yet, this building simply cuts across what it requires and what it uses. Between a kind of architectonic logic and a paper principle, reuse and re-editing, weaving mm -hmm. between different works, different engagements, different perceptions, the, re the reader, the visitor, the encounter, the text, a kind of reuse, recycle, re-edit. Um, and in a sense, it's always, let's say, never quite finished, never quite complete, um, and begs the question, what's the purpose of returning? What's the purpose of choosing and going back to the text? 
Um, and so that's, I mean, just kind of where we're thinking and the mm -hmm. ideas and kind of thinking through, let's say, how does the live act and the kind of live edit, as mm -hmm. well as, let's say, the present moment conceive of, let's say, the past and how can the past be remobilized for a kind of future understanding. Um, and this is an aspect of the work for paper on Normi, kind of a fatwa uh, for mm -hmm. the removal of suspicion and doubt which is on display. And it's part of a work that you're doing, uh, weaving words um, that maybe you can speak. Yeah, well, uh, these questions uh, for me and a colleague and a friend of mine, Bilal Orfali, we're thinking through these questions and we're both medievalists and feel very passionately about this uh, fascinating body of literature. And we're thinking of how it can come back uh, to us today as uh, new readers, uh, what uh, aesthetic but also uh, readership habits that changed we're talking about a thousand years and how can it be part of uh, can we tap into the potentials that were initially created in the work and not simply reproduce the text and uh, we uh, came up with this idea of um, uh, weaving words in a collaboration with an artist where the Oh, conversations produce visual interpretation of the work. And today I will share the first volume. Um, I have copies if you're interested. And now uh, uh, it's only fortuitous that I'm doing this here because the Library of Arabic Literature, which is an institute with the NYU Abu Dhabi, adopted our project. And now we're going to do 10 different. Uh, Experiments, I think, of how to read these texts and expand the concept of readership to include, uh, you know, how we as interpreters matter more. And uh, it's not only present and relevant, but it's also ours. And we're also open for collaborations. We still have seven with no artists to collaborate with. So it's an ongoing project, uh, like Maat said. And this is how we connected. Uh, through uh, thinking of how to start a conversation and collaborate on these questions. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And for having us. Thank and you, Maha. Thank you, Allah. No, okay. And there are books yes. that Ines has as well for people to take away. Yes. Um. Thank you. Well... <laughs> uh, we've come to the end of the, this very long day. It looks like the people that we started yesterday with are the people who are still here. The Symposium where can, where Heroes. Can put them? Uh, just want to thank you all again for being here with us okay. yesterday and today. Hopefully this is just the beginning of an ongoing conversation. Yeah, Our door is the... always open. Uh, please come back just to visit or for projects or anything you want. We're always here and ready. And uh, we have a dinner here tonight. <laughs> I'm sure everyone's hungry. So please join us uh, for oh, dinner and you. we can thank continue you. the conversations there. I want to thank my lovely, lovely friends, Maha again, for this opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I drove, that was beautiful, what you did. I drove them crazy at times. I'm I sure they hated like me at times. They cursed at me at times, but I'm sure they still love me a little bit more. Oops. Sorry. I broke it. And of course, Mace. Mace and Aisha for doing all these great works, making this happen. Sorry for being late, but we are done. <laughs> and uh, But we're not done in this uh, friendship that we're proposing, extending. And hopefully you'll meet again and work more and more again. And thank you for having this uh, very beautiful conversation.